This video is brought to you by the Logitech Lightspeed wireless range of keyboards, mice and headsets, the benchmark in wireless gaming performance. This is a review of the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3060. I've spent some time with the card, I've got all of the benchmarks, and just looking at NVIDIA's reviewer's guide, it says we should expect performance in line with the RTX 2070 for $330. Meanwhile, in the real world, a perfect storm of semiconductor shortages and a new, ferocious cryptocurrency mining boom kind of separates MSRPs from a reality where GPU prices are sky high. That's the situation, we can't deny it. But look, it can't really be the focus of this review, which is to tell you about the product, not surrounding market conditions. So let's take a look at the specifications of the RTX 3060 then. NVIDIA says it's a successor to the venerable GTX 1060, still the most popular GPU in the world, according to the Steam hardware survey. At launch, MSRP of the 1060 was $299. So for $30 more not adjusting for inflation, NVIDIA reckons you're getting twice the performance and twice the amount of frame buffer memory. So yeah, bizarrely, 3060 comes with 12 gigabytes of memory, more than 3080, more than 2080 Ti. There are some baffling elements to the makeup of this new product, as we shall see, but that's definitely the standout point. Well, that and the name itself. Here's how the specifications for the RTX 3060 stack up against the similarly named 3060 Ti, of course. With that 12 gigs of GDDR6, the 3060 actually has a significant memory advantage over the Ti. But otherwise, cutbacks are significant. 4,864 CUDA cores of the more expensive model are cut back to 3,584, while memory bandwidth drops from 448 gigabytes per second to 360. So despite being a part of the 3060 family, the TI is clearly a much more potent part. And remember that Nvidia itself is claiming circa 2070 performance for the 3060 while the TI is on par with the much more powerful 2080 Super, so there's quite a gap there. So off the bat, there's the sense that the name doesn't quite fit, while the balance between memory and compute is also at odds with expectations. I'll talk about that in a bit. In terms of the physical form factor of the card itself, there are no Founders Editions this time around, and that's generally what we tend to prefer for our showcase reviews. So expect a range of 3060s out there with various levels of factory overclocking attached. Our review sample is a Zotac Gaming Twin Edge, a more standard dual axial fan based card using an aluminium or aluminum thin stack array heatsink. Power comes via a standard 8-pin PCI Express input, and there's a 170-watt TGP on this one. Pretty standard stuff, and as you might have guessed from the power draw, which is of reference specs, well, so are the clocks on this one. No factory OC here. Max rated boost is 1777 megahertz. So let's dig into performance then, which is what it's all about, really. So, NVIDIA is positioning the 3060 as a 1060 successor aimed at 1080p gaming, and that may well be the case for future titles, but certainly in the here and now, if it's on par with the 2070, well, the 2070 is actually a really good 1440p performer, and benching at this resolution will mostly avoid results skewed by CPU limitations. And yes, you can find those with this product at 1080p, even with a high-end Core i9 10900K in select titles. But let's start by taking a look at the generational leap between 1060, 2060, 3060, and of course that 2070 standard that's been established. I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but Nvidia's claims do pan out. If we go from 1060 to 2060 to 3060, the huge increase to performance is clear. Powering through the Far Cry 5 benchmark here at 1440p Ultra, 3060 is indeed delivering ballpark twice the performance level of 1060, with the last gen 2060 basically delivering 85% of the throughput. I've also added the 2070 here as the performance benchmark that's set by Nvidia, and you'll see that this card and the 3060 are effectively trading blows throughout. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is interesting because there are certain games and game engines 
that just perform flat out better on more modern GPU architectures and they don't get much more modern than Ampere, right? Differentials vary between the three different segments in this benchmark, but generally the 1060 here is only delivering 40 to 46% of the 3060's output across the duration. A quick look at Assassin's Creed Odyssey before we move on from the 60 series head-to-heads. We're back in Far Cry territory really with a nigh on doubling of performance versus the 1060, a small uh, but variable lead over the 2070, while a straight gen-on-gen -gen comparison against the 2060 sees the old Turing entry-level offering delivering around 85% of the 3060's throughput on average. But let's move on to the meat and drink of our benchmarks here, where our focus shifts away from the 60 series comparisons and more towards closer relations to the 3060. Got the 3060 Ti, obviously, we keep the 2070 and also factor in the 1070. We're circling back to Shadow of the Tomb Raider for a moment and you can see that there's a fairly consistent delta between 2070 and 3060 in the Ampere card's favour. But you'll also see that 2070 and 3060 sit within the centre of the graph while 3060 Ti are top and bottom. So what I'm basically trying to illustrate here is that while the leap from 1070 to 3060 is substantial, so is the leap upwards to 3060 Ti. Shadow is a game that favours the Ampere architecture then, but there are others that show equally impressive gains. So in Doom Eternal here, the 3060 significantly outperforms 2070. It's actually delivering something much closer to 2070 super performance here. And that's really impressive, actually cutting into the TI's lead a touch. Pascal is left for dust. Uh, Nvidia reckons the 3060 is twice as fast as 1060, but here is pretty much twice the speed of the much more capable 1070. Remedies Control next, a touch academic as a benchmark here perhaps, as we're benching without DLSS in order to create a consistent, repeatable experience across generations and across GPU vendors. Uh, but we will look at DLSS in a bit. But still, 3060 dukes it out with 2070, moving ahead marginally, but again delivering a 74% advantage over the 1070. Or to put it another way, the 1070 offers just 57% of RTX 3060's output. But yeah, 3060 Ti, it's 31% faster than the new card, a gap comparable to the frame rate increase moving from 3070 to 3080. Rounding off the super performers, we have the unlikely next-gen GPU battleground that is Borderlands 3. It's always been a demanding game and also it's a pretty impressive Unreal Engine 4 showcase. So yeah, very much a modern engine, Ampere friendly. There is a small performance uplift over the RTX 2070, but it is interesting to see that Pascal keeps pace a bit more closely this time around. 1070 delivers 69% of 3060 performance. In the 3060 family of GPUs, again, the gap here is huge. There's a big, big 36% increase uh, between 3060 and 3060 Ti. Let's move on to Death Stranding next. Again, a bit of an academic exercise really since DLSS is effectively a free performance boost here, one that 1070 can't offer. But still, virtual parity with the 2070, but there's also that big, big jump between 3060 and its Ti counterpart. I think at this point the narrative pretty much speaks for itself in terms of what kind of performance this new product offers, but still, Dirt Rally 2.0 indicates that there can be some results that upset the apple cart here. I was surprised to see that the 2070 offers up an 11% performance lead in like-for-like -like benchmarking on Codemasters Dark Souls of Driving Games. 3060 Ti also opens up its usual lead too. Do think this one is probably a bit of an outlier though in terms of 2070 versus 3060 comparisons. We have all of the numbers on more games across 1080p, 1440p and 2160p resolutions in our Eurogamer text review, but I'll close this section with Metro Exodus. Again, a slight 2070 lead here in the region of 5% and again the 3060 Ti has a commanding 40% lead. Ray tracing is our next focus and we'll stay with Metro Exodus for now where the 3060 actually takes a small lead over 2070 
reversing the situation from the pure rasterized experience. But 3060 Ti is still a good chunk faster, 39% to the better. Interesting to note that RX 6800 is also faster, but that is more of a competitor to 3060 Ti really, in terms of RT performance. And again, of course, we're not factoring in DLSS here. Now, this is likely to be much more of an interesting battle when the upgraded Metro Exodus comes along. It's built on ray tracing, the first AAA engine to really do so, and it supports the latest DLSS, so that should be really exciting stuff. Next up, the demanding control and the resource sapping test that is Alex Battaglia's Corridor of Doom. Scourge of PCs and now consoles alike. Not much to say on this from a benchmarking perspective that we've not seen already, except to say that we're inching ahead of RTX 2070 uh, across the length of the bench, but the 3060 Ti still has that big, big lead. Interestingly though, this time around RX 6800 only has a 13% lead over what is clearly the least capable of the new wave of RTX cards. But yeah, we're going to talk a bit more about control shortly. Finally, let's take a look at the OG RT showcase, Battlefield 5, which concentrated heavily on delivering ray traced reflections, and in this stage we really put that through its paces. Again, there's a small lead overall against RTX 2070, 3060 Ti streets ahead to the tune of 32 of your percentage points, while the RX 6800 15% ahead. But notice that there's some profound consistency issues here. Lowest 1% scores are way, way lower. But let's course correct for a moment and talk about actual game experiences, something we often forget to do in GPU reviews, which are often all about the numbers. Now this is an Ampere card, and we've been testing at 1440p here because, you know, in rasterization terms, that seems to be the best fit. But the implication from the PR is that this is intended for 1080p next-gen titles, something we can't really test that extensively at the moment. Now, bear in mind uh, that we're looking at hardware here that on a rasterization level at least probably isn't quite up to par with PS5 and Xbox Series X. What's interesting is how Nvidia has made different technological bets and come up with different solutions that have already delivered some awesome results. DLSS is of course the prime case in point, but what you're looking at here is control running at 4K output, but using DLSS performance mode from a native 1080p to upscale to 4K. The 3060 isn't a 4K card, but it's capable of running the PS5 rasterization feature set and higher precision RT reflections with a general improvement in image quality at 50 to 60 frames per second. Run this game on a variable refresh rate screen and you're getting an experience that I prefer to play over any of the console versions. Of course, that's using a 4K screen with a 4K output. 1440p display far better fit for this class of hardware. Scale down to that and this would lock at 60 frames per second. But perhaps more interesting and more in line with this next gen at 1080p idea is this particular rendition of control. DLSS up from native 720p, equivalent to DLSS quality mode basically, and we can run the game virtually locked at 60 frames per second with all ray tracing effects enabled, which you don't get on the consoles at all. So you're getting the total package here at 1080p60. It's pretty awesome. Another example here is Cyberpunk 2077. You don't really get more next gen than that right now. I'm using DLSS performance mode at 1080p output resolution with Alex's optimized settings, RT lighting engaged, and while it doesn't lock to 60, clearly, again, a VRR screen will produce a very pleasing effect, and again, you won't get anything like this on consoles as things stand. Of course, we are leaning somewhat on DLSS here, but make no mistake, AI has a huge role to play in the future of gaming and it's already starting to pay off, clearly. One final component of the 3060 is the inclusion of resizable bar, which essentially allows for the CPU to more directly access graphics memory on the GPU, reducing PCI Express bottlenecks and improving performance. We've already looked at early work here from AMD and while results were muted at higher resolutions, we saw promising stuff from 1080p and 1440p. 
RTX 3060 is the first NVIDIA desktop card to support it. And yup, assuming you have a supported motherboard and CPU, you get a free performance uptick, the extent of which will depend on your components and the game. I'm using our 10900K test system here with an ASUS Maximus 12 Extreme motherboard, which does support resizable bar. And yes, it works here with the 3060. Battlefield 5 is by far the biggest performance uplift in the three games I tested. 17% performance boost at 1080p, 15% at 1440p. Interestingly, I saw a similar rise to frame rates on AMD in this title too. Now other games are supported and they need to be validated and whitelisted at the driver level by Nvidia. But here in Metro Exodus, we're getting two to two and a half percent of extra frame rate. So not really a big deal as such, but well, nice to have, I guess. Meanwhile, in Watch Dogs Legion, there's a 5% increase at 1080p on Ultra, dropping to around 3.5% at 1440p. Early days for this technology, and clearly some titles, will benefit more than others, but intriguing nonetheless. So let's wrap everything up then. It's a difficult one because there's the sense that 3060 Ti and upwards have really brought the value in terms of straight gen on gen comparisons between Turing and Ampere. As I've mentioned, 3070 is the new 2080 Ti, 3060 Ti matches 2080 Super. And then there's a big gap in the drop down to the standard 3060. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, well, this is obviously a great upgrade product if you're an owner of a GTX 1060. But let's say that we could live in a world where the 3060 and the 3060 Ti could actually be purchased at MSRP. It's difficult to ignore just how much more you get from the Ti, even if it has less memory. It's a bit of a tricky one for sure. If it was possible to get eight gigs onto the 3060 and bring the price under $300, that would sure make a lot more sense. But the memory interface makes that tricky. I guess the way to sum this up is to say that the 3060, clearly a huge upgrade over the 1060, no doubt about it. And really, I'd say it's time for an upgrade there. And in that sense, the value is obvious, assuming MSRP is doable, of course. But it does highlight the price performance sweet spot of the TI, which is a class apart, despite the naming suggesting that performance is a lot closer than it actually is. And of course, it would be remiss of me not to mention that an AMD RX 6700 and 6700 XT, they're apparently on the way next month. And a resurgent AMD has clearly brought options to the higher performance bracket, thanks to the RDNA 2 architecture. We've seen more modestly sized GPUs based on the same technology, handing in impressive results on PS5 and Series X. So it's gonna be intriguing to see how they stack up against the 3060 here. But until then, that's all from me. Please, as usual, like, subscribe, share, and ring the bell for the full power of instant notifications. The DF Patreon, membership has its privileges. And uh, specifically, this gives you access to the DF Discord and pristine quality video downloads of everything we do. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry. A breakthrough in design and engineering, the G915 features Lightspeed Pro-Grade Wireless, Advanced Light Sync RGB, and new high-performance, low-profile mechanical switches. Meticulously crafted from premium materials, the G15 is a sophisticated design of unparalleled beauty, strength, and performance. Meet G15 Lightspeed and play the next dimension.